Hi, I'm Phil Constantine, and this is Travels with Phil. It's the 50th anniversary of the first landing on the moon. That was Apollo 11th, and that happened on July 20th, 1969. So let's take a look back at that flight. I was fortunate enough that I actually worked at NASA in the Johnson Spacecraft Center. Now, I was, didn't do a lot of important stuff, but I helped run the computers later on in Apollo 16 and 17 in Skylab. Those are my old ID cards. Well, I was fortunate enough to meet lots of astronauts while working there and later in media. That's Buzz Aldrin from Apollo 11. That's also Michael Collins, who was the man that orbited the moon while Aldrin and Armstrong landed. And that's capsule communicator Capcom Charlie Duke. And this is the moon, and you'll see here where the uh, Apollo 11, the first landing on the moon, first time people stepped foot on the moon, landed right there where it says 11. Number five was the surveyor. So let's take a look around at the actual astronauts themselves. This is Neil Armstrong, one of his early pictures while working for NASA, but he was a pilot, a jet pilot. He was also a test pilot for quite some time. That's the X-15, one of the earlier space-type uh, airplanes that was out there. That's him of, with the flying bedstead, as the astronauts like to call it. And this is his official portrait, astronaut portrait for NASA. This is his, uh, what I call the sleepy Snoopy look. And then this is later in his life. Neil has since passed on, uh, but uh, he was an interesting person. Didn't sign a lot of autographs, by the way. And then this is Buzz Aldrin. He actually made Buzz his official name. Buzz was a nickname as a child uh, from his uh, sisters. And he was also a test pilot. He uh, was a, an ace, I believe, in Korea. And this is his official NASA portrait. And then coming up here, Michael Collins, the man who stayed up in the command module and orbited the moon while Neil and Buzz walked on the moon. He eventually became head of the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum. An interesting guy. I met him as well, as you saw in that picture earlier. And uh, he was, they said he had the best sense of humor of the three guys that uh, landed on the moon. All right, and that's a picture I took, actually. All right, let's take a look at the spacecraft themselves. All right, this is the Saturn V rocket, one of the biggest rockets that's ever been built. It's enormous. Well, they had to assemble it in that building that you saw back there. It was the largest air-conditioned building in the world for a while. This tractor that takes it out there moves it at one mile an hour to be able to move it without shaking it as it goes from the place where they put it together. That's the command module that you see there on the right, the surface module on the left. That's Werner Gunt. The uh, Pad Führer, as they called him. And then this is the lunar module, uh, two parts. One landed and the other one uh, took off after they landed. So where did the Apollo program come from? Well, here's John Kennedy. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Rice was my old alma mater, and so that joke about Rice in Texas, Rice wasn't known NASA's for football. Flight Research Center at Edwards proposed a free flight lunar landing simulator program. The research test vehicle was intended to investigate the inherent problems of lunar descents where there is no drag and weight is only one-sixth of Earth. An advanced version of the LLRV, the Lunar Landing Training Vehicle, or LLTV, proved to be an excellent simulator and was highly regarded by the Apollo lunar module crews as necessary to lunar landing preparation. I was most fortunate to be involved throughout the entire lunar flying development. I had the pleasure of flying every one of the machines, the LLRF, the ground-based simulators, the LLRV, the LLTV, the lunar module, and even the Weber ejection seat, the last not by choice. NASA management was forever worried about the reliability and safety of these machines and continually wanted to shut them down. But the pilots insisted they were vital to lunar landing preparation, and they prevailed. So after all the training, it was time to get ready to do the launch. Now that took a long period of time. Steak and eggs breakfast, that was been a uh, tradition among astronauts. And this you can see them putting on their equipment there. 
And uh, this takes quite a while to get everything adjust adjusted properly. That's Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin. And it takes a lot of, of uh, personnel to get everything properly attached, properly adjusted, make sure it fit properly, make sure it uh, didn't uh, was an abrasive. And they documented everything. Uh, I know when I worked at NASA, I didn't do anything important, and we documented everything. So you can imagine what they did with the uh, important things. And then once they were in their suits, it was time to get out, take the little transport van, and go the three-some-odd miles over to the pad itself. They keep these things far enough away that uh, the uh, rockets, when they go up, if they were to explode, it wouldn't cause any damage to the buildings. I was there for a, a shuttle takeoff. And three some odd miles away, which is closer than the general public can get, you could feel the heat. You really could feel the heat when the rockets uh, would go up. So, and the Saturn was even bigger, and it shook everything in the area when that thing went off. So, this is uh, them driving out and all the folks taking pictures of them as they went along. Now, this is launch control at Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy. The vehicle starting to pressurize as far as the propellant. Jack King is doing the narration. Werner von Braun who helped design the rockets. Firing command coming in now. We're on an automatic sequence as the master computer supervises hundreds of events occurring over these last few minutes. Early 60, almost everybody in white shirts and black ties. This is July 16th, 1969. 55 seconds and count. Over a million people came out to watch it. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. Six. swing arms because they swing away from the rocket as it takes off. All of these actions you see right here are all happening at the same time. The white flakes you see coming down, they have to keep the rocket cool, the fuel cool, so this is ice that's condensed on the outside of the uh, rocket. And I know from my own experience watching it, the liftoff actually is very, very slow, but just very quickly, it is just out of there. And one of the most critical parts of any launch uh, or flight is uh, clearing the tower. So all you gotta do is drift it just a few inches away and you're banging into things and that's not good on a controlled explosion. I was 16 at the time that Apollo 6, uh, 11 took off. Just phenomenal experience. And a couple of days later, they were at the moon. Houston, we see you on the stairwell, over. Roger, Eagle, then dot. Only one person talks Roger, to the I'm astronauts. The Eagle has wings. Roger. He's called Capcom. Go, He's also an astronaut. Go, 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 That's Gene Kranz, go, flight go, director. Go, you hear him talking to the other folks, for making sure everything's Alpha okay for landing. Go for landing, over. Roger, understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. You're yeah, looking great. How you doing, Control? We look good here. Fine. Roger, how about you, Telcom? Go. Guidance, you happy? Go. Fido. Go. 2,000 feet. 2,000 feet. Into the ag. 47 degrees. Roger. 47 degrees. Still looking very good. Here go. Top alarm. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. 1201 alarm. Same type, we're go, flight. Okay, we're go. We're go, same type, we're go. 
Altitude 1600. Eagle looking great. Roger 1202, we copy it. He landed with 17 seconds of fuel left. Coming down to 23. 540 feet down at 15. 1050 feet down at 4. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. At 40 feet down two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Down a half. 30 seconds. Forward, drift. Dust. Ready? Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Charlie Duke wiping his head. Very smooth touchdown. So that's Charlie Duke, Jim Lovell, sitting next to him. And here's a comment from him 40 years later. But the one thing, people may have heard your voice. They may not that's remember me. your name, but they've heard your voice. Because when Neil Armstrong landed, you remember what you said? I do. Yeah, that was indelibly ingrained in my mind. Uh, after a few seconds after they touched down, uh, Neil said, uh, Houston, tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. And I responded with... Uh, with such excitement, I couldn't even pronounce twain. Uh, I said tranquility, and uh, now I corrected myself. Said, Roger, tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Absolutely. Yeah. So you are part of that special of event. Yeah, all really, of history. It really was special. Really good guy. And then they walked on the moon. Getting back up to that first step. Uh, now these are some side-by-side -side comparisons. Uh, as I said, I was 16 when I watched this, and the picture was very fuzzy. Roger, we copy. It's a pretty good little jump. So this is Neil from a camera on the uh, spacecraft itself. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming. You'll hear a delay because there's a time of delay for the time it takes to get to the moon and back. Okay, I just checked uh, getting back up to that first step. Uh, it's, uh, too far. There's a big space but, between uh, the bottom step and the moon because I wasn't sure how far I was going to go up. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. What's this? Iran Here. computer. Phil Constantine fly. was at MSC. Yeah, this is you? That's Apollo me. 16, back years in years the ago. day. Back National in the day. National Space. Where were you? Are you down in Houston? Yeah, he was in I Houston. Was, uh, he, Phil? Gene, that, that, that you record that, would you please? <laughs> yeah. oh, well, let me put a number under that. There you go. <laughs> now, I ran I ran the computers downstairs from where you did were. You, you did? I was going to get some San Diego. Uh, looking for work. I was here when I got out of flight training. The first place I came to when I was a young man was at Miramar. Mm -hmm. really? So you're back home. So I'm back home. I was married here. I was married at the chapel at Miramar. I was, I was here with Shepard Flew. A lot of history for me. This is Gene Cernan we're talking to. Flew on Jim and I. Flew on Apollo twice. He's one of three men who've actually been around the moon three, uh, twice. Three I'm on the moon, too. Have you, have you been on the moon, too? Okay. The special significance that you have, which you know, is he is the last person to leave the surface of the moon. And that was uh, 38 years ago. Well, 30, a little over 36, but 36. far too long. Yeah. Yeah. Far too long. Well, I remember talking to you in the 80s, and that was when it was about 20 years, and you said you couldn't yeah. believe it had been 20 years. So well, yeah. now it's been almost 40. Well, you know, and back in... Uh, in but we got back, we flew in December of 72, so in 73 I got on my soapbox down at Kennedy thanking him for everything, and I said, you know, I got tired of being, you know, how's it feel to be the end, the tail of the dog, the last one over the fence? It's not the end, it's just the beginning. I, I made a statement then. I said, we're not going to go back to the moon by the end of the decade. That was 70, January 73. Right. We'll be on our way tomorrow by the turn of the century. My glass has been half empty for 25, 30 years. But now, if we continue on with the program that President Bush laid out, if we continue on, and we have to continue on because there's too much at stake, uh, 
my glass will then be half full, no longer half empty. NASA's next chapter of lunar exploration, called Artemis, has the task of not just going to the moon to create a long-term human presence on and around it, but also to prepare for ever more complex human missions to Mars. In short, everything we must be able to do here, we must first do here. So, what will an Artemis mission look like? Everything is designed and tested with our most important element in mind the astronauts. This is their deep space, human-rated spacecraft called Orion, built in three parts. The crew module, where up to four astronauts will live and work throughout the flight. The service module, with life support systems for the crew and its own engine and fuel reserves. And a launch abort system, with engines capable of pulling the crew module to safety during launch should anything go wrong. To accomplish the task of launching our crew in heavy payloads, NASA is building the Space Launch System, comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there is no stopping what comes next. All four RS-25 engines and the two solid rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft and check systems to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. With a go from mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intersect the moon days later. Once this burn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days toward all that awaits them at the moon. Approaching the moon, we see the fundamental differences between Artemis and Apollo. Instead of requiring Orion to serve as an expendable lunar command module or to carry a constrained lunar lander, the Artemis missions will take advantage of a different approach, pre-staging. Everything needed for lunar missions will be positioned in advance by commercial and international partners. This includes rovers, science experiments, and human-rated systems on the surface. But it also includes a dedicated lunar station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. Here at this station, we can pre-stage a robust lunar lander and establish a strong communications relay. Designed with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded as new missions and partnerships develop, allowing multiple human missions on the moon at the same time and enabling ongoing science to be conducted even between human missions. The Gateway is also capable of adjusting its orbit to allow access to every part of the moon, something the Apollo missions could not do. But the real key in this approach is placing Gateway in a unique halo orbit to perfect the maneuvers needed for Mars missions. And with the growing list of commercial and international opportunities, Gateway is the ideal hub between Earth and all that lies beyond. Returning to our crew as they approach Gateway, the Orion must match the elliptical orbit of the station in order to successfully dock. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the lunar lander, while those assigned to Gateway remain on station. The lunar lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of Gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting gateway. Once back aboard the Orion spacecraft and undocked from gateway, the crew fire their engine once to break out of the halo orbit and once again to sling the spacecraft around the moon, placing it on a multi-day trajectory back towards Earth. As they near the end of this journey, 
The service module is released, and the crew module is oriented heat shield first. Entering Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, the friction of air slows Orion considerably, while also subjecting it to temperatures of 5,000 degrees. With the Orion now at just 300 miles per hour, a series of parachutes uniquely tested and produced for this moment deploy, decelerating the craft to just 20 miles per hour for splashdown. With each successful mission, Artemis ushers in the next wave of men and women to explore our moon and prove that together we are ready to go beyond.